guys, welcome to my second video for Vlogmas. Like I said last week, I'm going to be doing a new video every day until Christmas, every weekday until Christmas. So I did one on Friday, all week long, Monday through Friday, I'll have a new video here. I'm going to apologize in advance that this video is quite long. I'm trying to keep the next few videos, or for the rest of Vlogmas, on the shorter side, both because I know lots of people are doing Vlogmas, you guys have more videos to watch, I have lots of videos to edit, so I want to keep them shorter, but this video I filmed throughout the month of November at the end of each week kind of thing. I did a wrap up of the books that I read that week and that has been a really good way to update. I'm going to continue this for a while because this is currently my favorite way to share what I've been reading because the books are still fresh in my mind, but I don't have to like film a video the second after I'm done. So I read a lot of, it, of books in the month of November. I have my stack right here. Um, I have a lot. So let's get into it. I hope you find some good reads that you'll want to read in the future. Welcome to my first wrap-up week. Um, I got a lot of pages to update you on this week because I did a lot of reading, mostly because I was sick at the beginning of the month slash the end of October. So because of that, I had expected to finish Wives and Daughters by the end of November, but instead I finished it on November 1st. So I had a giant TBR planned for the month and it felt a little daunting and unattainable. And now it actually feels doable because I checked this off on the very first day. So Wives and Daughters. I have thoughts and feelings. First of all, what is this book about? Our main character is Molly Gibson. She is 12 for a small portion of the book and then she's mostly like, let's say 17 to 19 through the rest of the book or so. And when she's 17, her father remarries, like her mother died when she was just a few years old. And he remarries this woman who also has a daughter the same age as Molly. And the stepmom, I, like where she's supposed to be annoying like all these red dabs pretty much are her being annoying and she's supposed to be but she's so aggravating like I just wanted to punch the lady and I'm not like a physically violent person but she and the problem is she always came across as so nice but she would just use like these little white lies all the time and like say one thing and then twist things to like work for her and then say like another thing or and then she would just imply that like oh but she's not like that or oh she drove me up a wall there was like this one scene where this stepmom was talking she was like i think this time i must secure her ladyship from the chances of such an intrusion by taking care that you are out of the house molly and then like two paragraphs later well the stepsister says if you want molly out of the way mama send her to the miss brownings and then she says i never said i wanted molly out of the way that's literally what she just said da so um i enjoyed the story like hmm um elizabeth Gaskell did die before writing the final chapter, which is unfortunate, but like you could see where it was going. Um, so it wasn't that big of a deal to the story, but I don't like reading a book where I dislike a character so much all the way through. And then like Molly's just meekly taking it, being a very, you know, woman of her time in the fact that she's just, she's not speaking out against her elders. She's, ah, she's so nice. And the stepsister too. She's got her own issues, but like, I was just so annoyed at the mother so much. Um, so yeah, to me, North and South is a much better book because I was less frustrated reading it, but I definitely enjoy Elizabeth Gaskell's writing and can't wait to read more of her books. But the stepmother, you guys, like, going down is one of my least favorite characters, that's for sure. Then I decided to read my nonfiction November pick I am reading quite a few nonfiction books in November, especially since my patrons in our book club picked out two nonfiction books for me to read this month. But my official pick in my TBR had been A Charm of Goldfinches and Other Wild Gatherings. This is Quirky Collective Nouns of the Animal Kingdom. And it's just a fun little book about different, like a pod of pelicans, a crash of hippos, um, uh, an array of hedgehogs 
cute illustrations, um, like some information about the animals and then also just like some funny stuff like in the plague of rats he says uh oh, it wasn't much fun researching this illustration i can tell you looking at swarms of brown rats does have a bit of a stomach turning effect and i cannot blame you at all if you want to turn the page immediately but please give it a few more seconds of your time as i took ages on that painting so like there's there's some like humor that goes along with it as well um and it was just it was just a cute little interesting read so i enjoyed that that was a that was a really good pick for nonfiction november plus if you really want to just like easily check a box that's a really good one and then i read my buddy read for the month and that is my plain jane this is by cynthia hand brody ashton and jody meadows i do not understand how people write with other people and make a book flow so well uh, so this is book two in the Lady Janie's series, but they do not need to be, at least books one and two, do not need to be read in order. This had nothing to do with book one. This is our main character, kind of, there's kind of two, but is uh, Jane Eyre. But our other main character is Charlotte Bronte. And I guess technically we have a third main character. His name is Alexander. I feel like the, the girls are the main characters. They start out at Lowood, which is where Charlotte Bronte actually went to school, I think? Or was it actually where Jane... Oh, I don't actually remember now. Is that where the place... Hmm. I do feel like that was Charlotte's actual school growing up. And it was a terrible place. But what we find out when, as soon as we get into Jane's chapters is that, well, I mean, it says right here, she sees dead people. So in this, there's something called the... Society for Wayward something or other. They're a society that helps people get rid of their ghosts if they are, you know, pestering people. And But not all ghosts are. So Jane can see ghosts and the society really wants her on their team. This book has some Jane Eyre parts to it, but it's also like partly just very fictitious, very fantasy. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It reminded me a little bit of Victoria Schwab's um, City of Ghosts book. I don't normally like ghosts, but I totally enjoyed it in this. Um, Jane has a particular ghost friend named Helen who used to be her friend at Lowood and then she died because that place was terrible and I really liked Helen and there's a bit of a mystery going on and like knowing the story of Jane Eyre I was curious to know like would they follow the Jane Eyre storyline like or like I knew it was going to be different, but like I was curious to see what they kept in and what they changed and it was, I don't know, it's just interesting. And there's so many like laugh out loud moments in here, but you kind of have to be reading the story and like understand the story in order to get them. Like I can't just read them to my family members, which are things that I do sometimes if they're like funny sentences. And for the most part, these ones were like, we well, kind of got to know what's going on in order to understand why it's so funny. But it's just very cheeky humor. There was lots of references to different things, so I was instantly looking up Mad King George because I didn't know anything about him. There's lots of uh, different bookish quotes in here, references to Oliver Twist. Um, now I'm going to totally blank on all the other ones, but there's just all sorts of different hints dropped about different books and different things in history. He keeps it locked in a room guarded by a three-headed dog which drops in to a pit of strangling vines followed by a life or death life or death life-size game of chess etc so there's all these insertions of other things in here my name is alexander blackwood you killed my father prepare to you know you get the idea maybe um and th that's just fun to come across those and i love that it makes me research different things and i've thoroughly enjoyed this book even more so than Lady Jane Grey or My Lady Jane I think it was called. Can't wait to read book three. It's about Calamity Jane. So we're going very different but yeah thoroughly enjoying this. Just a fun like slightly absurd just just for fun kind of read. So I would recommend it. Okay.
Okay, we are on to week two and I have a three books to update you on. I talked a bit about these in my trying to read only fantasy for a week video. And so I've kind of cover covered some of the stuff, but I have more thoughts. So the first one is An Enchantment of Ravens. Sometimes like when I pick up a book, I'm like, why did I decide to pick up that one instead of all these other ones that I've wanted to read for a really long time? I don't know. In this book, our main character's name is Isabel, although we know that's not her true name, but we don't know what her true name is. She is a portrait painter, which is funny because I just read A Forgery of Roses last year, last month, which is also a fantasy book that has to do with portrait painting. Um, but Isabel is very skilled and she has been doing a number of paintings for the fair folk and she knows that they are very, what's the right word, like they can change their emotions really quickly and you, if you get on their bad side that's not good. Um, but for her payment she will often receive different enchantments and she's a very practical girl and generally tries to have like enchantments be things that are helpful like there's one where if she's in her house she cannot be hurt or um, her hens lay six eggs every day things like that there was an enchantment that somehow went wrong and somehow her goats became her sisters I, that one is still a little fuzzy like i wish there would have been more explanation on that in this book that's one of the things that i was like oh is there gonna be a second book because i feel like that was very like left open and I had so many more questions but to my knowledge this is just a single book like a standalone so I will always have these questions um anyway Isabel ends up paint doing a painting for the autumn prince and the reaction was less than stellar so she ends up having to go to the land of the fair folk and I kind of won't say any more from there um this was a hard one for me to start my reading vlog with, I think, because I kind of found it just a little bit bland. Like, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I couldn't say why I didn't really like it, but I couldn't... There was nothing that I could say, oh, I loved that. So in my reading journal, I gave it a 3.75 stars because I didn't know what else I should give it. It was like, it was better than three, maybe it was like three and a half. It was better than a three, but it wasn't a four, but it was interesting. So I did read that. And then I'll be quick on this one because I ended up DNFing Wayward. And if you watched that reading vlog, I I don't think there was really a reason that I DNF'd this other than I just really didn't care about any of the characters. And I was feeling like this book was maybe starting to put me in a bit of a reading slump. And if I continued with this, I think it would have like been a full on, full blown reading slump slump. We follow three different women in here. One from 1916, Elsa. She's waiting trial for murder of a local farmer. 1942, we are with Violet. She's 16 and she obviously, and I think every, all the women in this line here, has some kind of supernatural power with animals, insects, etc. And then 2019, we are with Kate. She ends up leaving an abusive relationship in the first her first chapter like we alternate between the three of them and there's definitely trigger warnings in here for like emotional physical like all kinds of abuse that wasn't really bothering me yet i don't know how much worse it gets like if there's more flashbacks or if things happen throughout the book i feel like a person can come from a, a dark place and have a good story but i just didn't care about any of the characters and then i've I've heard people say that I won't really like it and I don't, I'm not really even sure why, but I just really wasn't into it. And, and after being kind of feeling slightly like that with this book, then I really just wasn't in the mood for that. I really wanted a book that I wanted to read. So then I decided I was, was really tempted to like not continue with fantasy, but I really wanted to try an entire week of fantasy books. So I decided a wizard's guide to defensive baking. And this was exactly what I needed. This book, I, oh man, it, like I have a hard time explaining it because it was so good and so different than I was expecting. So our main character is 14 year old Mona. She is what she considers a lesser wizard because her magic just has to do with dough and like 
baking and she can infuse her magic into the dough and like convince it not to over um, mix or burn or she can make biscuits like a little fluffier after they've been made or things are going stale like you know like fairly minor um, and what ends up happening is there is someone in her city that is going around and killing these like wizards minor wizards right in the first chapter first sentence Mona comes across a dead body in her aunt's bakery which is where she works and then we are introduced to this character named Spindle who is kind of a bit of a street rat that helps her see a lot of what's going on. The writing is funny like there are just weird lines like like this random sentence that when you spend most of your time with a dead horse you learn to respect other people's weird pets. The book is like slightly absurd but it's also much darker than I expected or you would expect with like to have both of them is a little weird but it worked so well in my opinion. So T. Kingfisher is a pen name for Ursula someone or other, uh, Vernon. She normally writes middle grade, I guess they're like quite light, so I read this in the acknowledgments afterwards or the author's note. She really wanted to publish this book but her publishers were like, it's too dark, you would need to write a bunch of other books before you could write this one, etc. So she decided to self-publish it under T. Kingfisher and now she has a couple other books under this name that I really want to read because this book was it was like almost perfection for me. This is definitely like cozy fantasy, but also definitely a bit dark. Like there was one point where I was tearing up um, because things got really sad for a brief moment and I don't know, I just loved it. And Mona can also make gingerbread men dance. That's one of her like abilities. And I don't know, you guys, this like this went on my wish list. As soon as I finished it, I was like, okay, pull up Amazon, go on my wish list because I want to own this book. And I think that my 13 year old daughter would really like it. I would put this down like it says it's YA. I would say it's like straddling that middle grade YA boundary where my 13 year old is currently at where like middle grade is a little too young for her but YA is often a little too old and I feel like this book will be perfect for her. Even though lately she has not been into fantasy, I still think this will check her boxes so I'm gonna make her read this because I think she's going to love it. So highly, highly recommend this book. Thank you to everybody who suggested it, especially there was a lot of people in my cozy fantasy video that recommended this one and you guys were right. Okay, I think this is week three of the month and I have once again three books, well three books read, one DNF. Rika's currently vacuuming. So there's gonna be a little bit of background noise coming through, I think, uh, but I wanna talk about the book. So we're gonna pretend that's not going on. Hopefully it's not too disruptive. It shouldn't take too long. The first book that I finished is A Nun in the Closet by Dorothy Gilman. I don't know why I decided to read this book instead of continuing with the Mrs. Polifax series. I guess I was just curious to see if she could write other books as well as the Mrs. Polifax books. I can't wait to continue that series. But I recently hauled A Nun in the Closet plus The Tightrope Walker when I went to my local used bookstore and I just wanted to try it out. Personally, I would say it wasn't quite Mrs. Polifax level, but it was still fun. So in this book, we are started at this, with this group of nuns that have somehow inherited this house by this man they never met. Um, and so they decide that two of the nuns are gonna drive out to this place and check it out. I don't know if see what they want to do with it or something. I it, I started the book and then I read that whole week of fantasy books and then I came back to this so I don't remember if I forget some of the details of the beginning or if it was a little unclear. I didn't, I didn't quite understand why some things were happening but two um, nuns, Sister John and Sister Hyacinth get sent out to explore this place and all sorts of sketchy things start happening right away. First of all, these books were written in the 70s. So there is a group of like hippies that are apparently leftovers from the 60s that are kind of like camped out close to there. There's a group of 
migrant workers that are also kind of living around there and shortly after the sisters arrive they hear like some noises in the house and they end up finding a man in the closet who's been shot and so they try to care for him they end up finding a lot of money down a well and then suspicious things start happening sister john is kind of like our detective in this story things are making more sense to her she's she's putting the pieces together faster than other people yeah and so it was a interesting read like there's definitely some moments where there's like some light humor it definitely has those cozy mystery vibes but it just it wasn't quite mrs polifax level there was one mention of if we have to go upstairs unarmed you know there's a heavy iron skillet hanging on the wall behind you and that's secretly always been a dream of mine is to hit someone on the head with a like cast iron frying pan obviously this would have to be a dire situation i wouldn't just do this to random people but like they make it look so fun in movies so maybe i like have inner rapunzel tangled dreams or something yeah so overall a fun story if you come across it i'd say read it not gonna be an absolute favorite but i did enjoy it then next up i read finding lady enderly this one was on my tbr for the month and I thought it was going to have gothic vibes. I think people recommended it or maybe, I can't remember if people recommended it on my gothic video or if it was just when I put up my TBR that they mentioned it. I didn't find this to be gothic or like eerie at all. I actually, I started out not liking the book, which is sad to say because I really do, I've liked the other books I've read by her and I felt like the ending it, it kind of came together and redeemed itself. I think I gave it four stars. So we follow a girl named Raina, or a young woman. She is a rag lady, and like right at the beginning of the book, and I think this is where my problems kind of come in. Right at the beginning of the book, she's getting followed by this gentleman, and he ends up having this proposition for her to come work at this big kind of like manor house type thing. And I hadn't like, hadn't had we hadn't met her character yet, and she was kind of in the back alley with this guy and like I felt like I missed a chapter beforehand like we should have got to know Reina just a little bit as this rag lady and what that actually means um because I never felt like she was it was hard to remember that she started out so poor it did remind us but we never got to like sit with her in that she was just kind of instantly taken out of this space where she'd been for years of her life and pro like plopped into this rich area and so um, she goes, she is supposed to, wait a minute, can I say that? Yes, okay. So she, she really, she's kind of coming to, in some ways, like, impersonate Lady Enderly. Um, Lady Enderly wants or needs, like, some time to rest, apparently. And Raina looks enough like her that they think they can pass Raina off as Lady Enderly. And so she's going to this manor house, which... Lady Enderly has never been at, so it's not like these people have seen her before and are now seeing someone else. Um, they've never seen her there, so she's so kind of supposed to impersonate her or like, I don't know, be like her stunt double kind of idea. Um, and I struggled because a lot of the stuff, I don't know, at the beginning of the book, I saw it coming and I don't know if I was supposed to, but every like, kind of like reveal at the beginning, I was like, yeah, like I... I know that already or I, I strongly suspected it it didn't feel like a big reveal um, but then things kind of changed part way through and Raina I guess she makes some different decisions and there's like some other things going on that I didn't see coming so by the end of the book I did enjoy it so I gave this one four stars then I have still a few books on my non-fiction list that I wanted to read this year. So I had 12 nonfiction books I wanted to read by the end of the year. In our last Patreon book club gathering, I said, I gave my patrons the option to choose some nonfiction books for me to read. And um, the winner was Into Thin Air. And you guys, I read off to page 92 and I was just bored out of my mind. And I know he's supposed to be a good writer, but like I, I quit this one. So this is a personal account of the Mount Everest disaster. And to be fair, like I've never been interested in climbing Mount Everest. So maybe that's why I found the book boring. Uh, this first 92 pages made me less interested in, in climbing it. Like there's all these things that I wasn't aware of that are like normal 
that just sound terrible. Um, so mo what ends up happening, we kind of get a little bit of the story right from the beginning that a bunch of people in his climbing group or whatever they were called end up dying. And then we kind of flash back and we're following him as he's like getting to the mountain and meeting the people. And we get the backstory to like a bunch of the people and I just didn't care. And it was boring. There was like lots of facts about climbing and uh, I just didn't care. I know he makes it out because he writes books. He wrote this one after and he wrote other books. And I, I just, I don't care other than that. So that was a DNF for me which I feel bad because I know lots of people like his writing in his books and I have one more of his on my shelf I have Under the Banner of Heaven which that one I'm pretty sure I started at one point and couldn't get into so I don't know maybe his writing is not for me and then the last book that I have finished thus far is The Inspector and Mrs. Jeffries so originally I was gonna read what was it called The Ghost and Mrs. Jeffries is what I put on my TBR for the month but then I found out that you should read these in order. So I got book number one from the library and definitely, yes, you should read them in order. I'm actually currently reading the ebook for number two because I own three, four, five, six. So I just wanted to get the library books out of the way. So Mrs. Jeffries is a housekeeper and her employer is uh, Inspector Witherspoon of Scotland Yard. And he's a super nice guy, all his staff really like him but he's not like the best at solving mysteries so they secretly help him out and i love that it's not just mrs jeffries like she's definitely the head of everyone kind of organizing them all but everyone in the household plays their part like the guy that works with the horses and the maid and the cook like they all have their little different things that they're good at and i like that and so in this book there is a doctor who ends up poisoned and the inspector is struggling putting some things together so of course mrs jeffries and the entire staff do their part to try to help inspector witherspoon yeah that's his name out and they they try to do it discreetly like mrs jeffries is like oh like i know oh which i should have known that you were gonna do this thing next and he's like yeah yeah that's what i'm gonna do next but he's, he's a nice guy. He's not just like a complete fool. He's also super nice and he does have some smarts. So it's not like I'm cringing because he's doing such a terrible job with his detecting. Um, yeah, so I enjoyed it enough that I've started book two. I think I gave this one four stars, maybe four and a half. Like it's, it's just a fun, definitely cozy mystery type read. The first sentence starts out, Dr. Bartholomew Slocum was definitely dead. That's always a good start to a mystery book. So definitely going to be continuing the series because I currently am. I probably won't like read them all right away, but enjoying that. So I would recommend that series. And my final five books to wrap up, this will be like the last probably week and a half of the month. I'm going to start with my one non-physical book and that was The Last Devil to Die by Richard Osman. This is the first, the fourth book in the Thursday Murder Club series and I have listened to all of these on audio. I have not actually physically read these, which for someone that doesn't do audio very much at all, that's very strange. But the audiobook narrator is amazing. Um, yeah, she's just amazing. So in this book we follow once again our Thursday Murder Club, which is a group of retirees that all live at Cooper's Chase and somehow they keep stumbling across murders. Um, it's a very busy retirement village. In this one, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's husband's friend has been murdered and that's how they get kind of sucked into this. Um, it turns out that he is an antique stealer or was an antique stealer, which they knew, but apparently sometimes antique stealers will hold goods for drug dealers. So he was holding a, I think it was like a hundred thousand pounds of heroin, like Great Britain pounds of heroin uh, for this drug ring and someone was supposed to come pick it up. But instead he ended up shot and things went down. So they're trying to solve his murder. Now this book was almost my favorite. He did a couple things throughout the book that I'm not a fan of. Um, I can't even tell you because it would be spoilers 
So there's a couple things that I wasn't a fan of, but so much of the book was very, very good. I am Joyce. She's like uh, just a talkative old lady. And like that is that is who I am at heart. Um, I would love to be Elizabeth, like the former KGB spy, like tough woman. But no, I'm, I'm Joyce. I'm just like little old lady in my cardigan. The books are so fun. I love how Richard Osman has these like drug dealers or like criminals in all of his books and these retirees and often they will like meet face to face and have a very honest conversation and like the drug dealers will be like well I'm sorry I have to slash your tires and the old people are like yeah we get it like we were in your space like go ahead do what you need to do and like I don't know. How he takes these instances these possible scenarios and then puts them together. It just cracks me up so very much. I do think, I personally preferred book one. I know some people preferred book two. This one almost lived up to book one standards, but it has some heartbreaking moments, which I was not expecting. And he did a few things, which I just didn't really like. But at this point, I still plan on continuing the series because I'm hooked on it. Highly recommend it. Okay, now I'll go into my physical books. Let's, I continue, I read three books in one series this month. I never do that, but I did say in my previous clip that I was continuing the Mrs. Jeffries series. So Mrs. Jeffries' Dust for Clues was book two. And in this one, like they are continuing, the people in the household are continuing to help Inspector Witherspoon solve mysteries. So in this one, there, is a murder at a house and some valuables are missing and so it looks like a burglary gone wrong um, but Mrs. Jeffries possibly thinks otherwise so they help the inspector without his knowledge and do a little bit of digging and what I really like is I don't feel like they are like looking down on the inspector they really like him they he has helped each of them none of these people are really very hireable for various reasons and he continues to keep them employed even when he doesn't need this many employees or could get better ones. Um, he continues to help them and they want to repay him for his kindness by helping him solve mysteries and it's just been fun. So I read that one and then I continued on to The Ghost and Mrs. Jeffries and so far this one has been my least favorite. Unfortunately it's the one book so far that I own. I give this one three stars though. Like it was still just like a fun cozy mystery. So in this one, a, oh, I totally messed it up. This is the one that's a burglary, burglary gone wrong. This is why I don't normally read books in a series right next to each other. In this one, um, there was a parlor maid that went missing and she, the parlor maid was a friend of the employees of the house friend, a friend of a friend. So they tried to solve that mystery. In the meantime, um, some, remains of a body are found and that's what the inspector is working on so they help with that. In this one there is a burglary gone wrong that they help with. Uh, yeah so this is the problem with reading multiple books in a series in a row. I will probably take a break from the series for now but they are super quick reads like they these are short little books that are just around like the 200 page mark. Um, they've been fun. For the most part I've been reading ebooks. Um, I read a little bit physically every now and then have my trusty tabs as my bookmark, but I like to read these as ebooks when I was putting the little ones down to bed. Okay, very different vein. I read another nonfiction book. This one is A Waking Wonder. I was reading this one for a book club in my homeschool membership. This subtitle is Opening Your Child's Heart to the Beauty of Learning. It's by Sally Clarkson. This was a reread for me. Tons of tabs, tons of highlights. I highlighted even more things my second round. Let's see. Can you see the highlights? There's a lot of them. There was a lot of wisdom here. And so I'm not really going to talk about it because I did a whole book club on it, but this is just inspiration. It makes me wish I was homeschooled as a kid. I wish I could have been homeschooled the way she homeschooled her kids, but instead I want to try to homeschool my kids this way. So if you are a parent and even if you homeschool or not, I think this is a good book. And then the final book. I did a, <laughs> it was kind of a flop of a reading day. Things did not go as planned, but I did get some decent reading in. I did a vlog for my Windy Poplars tier on Patreon, Patreon one day, and I actually went out and bought Defiant, which is currently upstairs because Jared is reading it now. Um, I 
bought it on its release date and actually started reading it on its release date and realized I'd really like to be that person that goes and buys a book the day it's released, possibly like in store, and then starts reading it right away. I think I want to do that for some of my anticipated releases next year. So this is book four in the Skyward series. Once again, I feel like Sanderson really got back to those first book roots. This made me realize how much I didn't like book three. It explained a lot about book three and I realized how confused I was, but I loved this. So our main character, Spensa, lives on a planet that is constantly fighting these kind of like alien invaders. And because it's book four, I don't feel like I can say much, but I will say that this book was emotional. Sanderson has always had no trouble killing off characters, and even when you can see it coming, it's still very sad. Um, but yeah, this reminded me so much of book one, Skyward. I kind of just want to, like, I think book one and book four, that's all you really needed. Well, no, there was more to the story than that, but there's a lot going down, and I don't want to give any spoilers, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. But I do, if you've started the series and like you're slogging through book two or book three, please press on to book four because it's worth it. Okay, so that's officially my wrap up for the month of November. Sorry, this video is so long. I will be back again tomorrow with another video.